hope you can see that. Can Thank I you. please invite Dr. Guru Reddy, uh, one of the doyed of uh, Indian arthroplasty, to take us uh, through a robotic total knee replacement? Guruva, you've got Dr. Raj Gopal and Dr. Bulaji looking on very keenly. So they will be the ones asking you questions while we learn on as we go. Uh, can I expressly request these two guys to go and take a cup of coffee and not to come <laughs> back at all? Both yes, Ashok and Arun. So please get out of the hall. <laughs> Thank you. Right. I just got a recorded video. So we'll play that for you. And then uh, we will answer all the questions. The, in fact, robotic knee replacement is as uh, straightforward as a hip replacement. But I, I would say if you ask me where the robot is inevitable of the partially, totally, and total hip, I would say totally is the least, I would say. Partially and the total hip are the way to go only with the robot. Totally, a uh, robot adds some value to that, no doubt about that. And we are uh, use that. But especially mid flex instability and uh, release of soft tissue is minimal. I would feel that the, the milieu interior or soft tissue enclave is nicely preserved. And that is the reason why the post-operative pain is not there. Within three months, the outcomes are excellent. I'm not having any shares in the macro robot, but that's what my personal thing after 2,300 knee replacements with the robot. That's what I would feel. The one single most uh, take-home part is least violation of the soft tissue. And it will allow me to use the alignment which I'm comfortable with. Whether it's a kinematic alignment, limited kinematic, functional alignment, it doesn't matter within that limit. If you go beyond that limit, robot will not allow you to do that. But I can play with that. So far, which I could not do that. That is the opportunity it is given to me. And coming to the gross deformities, in fact, we are coming up with a paper. Gross deformities, but let us say manual, if I want to do 22 steps to release and make it balance, here it will be reduced to four or five steps. That much quantum of the Less release happens in the robot. Okay, we'll go with the video. Uh, are you sharing? Please share your screen, Dr. Guruva. Yeah, I'm sharing the screen. <sighs> Is Dasagir there to help you out? Yeah, yeah, help you out. Yeah, so uh, you see that? In yeah, my view, yeah, yeah, quite, yeah, quite, based yeah. pre operative 3D planning is what sets MACO apart from other systems available in the market. Here we will show you how to plan for a total knee arthroplasty. Right now, we are on the implant planning screen. On the right side of the screen, you can see details of the type of implant, the size of the femur, tibia, and insert thickness. We can change the size of the implants as per our requirement. The implant of choice can be selected from the drop-down menu. We have the options of a CR, CS, or PS for the femur, and cruciform or universal base plate for the tibia. The gray panel has all the toggles for multiple different views. Here, we can add or minus the implant over the native femur and tibia, simulate bone cuts, appreciate three-dimensional view of the bony anatomy and confirm the relationship of the femur to the transcondylar axis and posterior condylar axis. These multiple options of viewing aid us in appreciating the bony pathology of the arthritic knee and this knowledge helps us in planning for this. Paper. On the left of the screen, the 3D CT of the knee is arranged in three columns, coronal, axial, and sagittal. Each of these sections are used for different aspects of the 3D planning. We usually start with the axial view, where we scroll proximal and distal over the various cut sections to see which size fits best. VL size is decided by the AP fit on the lateral side. It also tells us how much osteophyte will be left after the cut is this is valuable information prior to going in for surgery. Similarly, the femoral size is decided based on the medial lateral fit and matching of the trochlea and the posterior condylar offset. Never before have we been able to plan for the femur this way. Here you can see using the size one, and by rotating the implant, we are able to match it to the trochlea of 
the native femur. Note the implant is below the magenta line, thus avoiding any anterior stuffing of the femur. Next in the sagittal view again, we can perfectly match and recreate the posterior condylar offset and flex the femur such that it just sits on the anterior surface, thus avoiding notching and matching the anterior bow of the femur. We also decide on the shape of the tibia make sure combined component flexion in the sagittal plane should not be more than 8 degrees. In the coronal plane, the medial lateral fit of the implants and where to position them can be determined. After deciding on the size and position, you can get information on what is the thickness of the bone cut. The numbers you can see in the center of the screen denote the individual cuts and the combined thickness. We have the ability to change the alignment of the implant in all six degrees of freedom, but we usually prefer doing it during surgery after the cap assessment has been made. To summarize, Preoperative planning is an excellent tool which helps us decide the perfect size and position of the implants. And uh, <clears throat> the particular patient, more importantly, now we have the ability to match the femoral component to the native trochlear groove, anterior bow, and the posterior condylar offset of the femur. We can also place the implant parallel to the transepicondylar axis and avoid notching. Now, let us talk about the theater setup. Should have enough space to put the robot, the screen, and the instrument trolleys. A quick glance on the pre op x rays. We are doing the left knee today. The leg position is uh, important. It takes away the necessity of the side post. The incision is a regular midline incision and a medial parapatellar arthrotomy is made just like in the normal knees. The medial release is done and fat pad is excised as much needed. So is the suprapatellar uh, excision of the fat pad. Now both ACL and PCL are excised. 3.2 Pins are placed on the anterior medial aspect of the femur, four fingers breadth above the patella. The pin should just hit the distal cortex. The femoral arrays are being placed. The arrays should point towards the camera. Now, the femoral checkpoint. We are placing the femoral checkpoint, which remains a constant point for the robot to refer to in further steps. This is placed in hard cortical bone. Now the tibial pin placement, again 3.2 mm pin is inserted, four fingers below the patella. Again, it can touch the far cortex. The both femoral and tibial arrays are fixed to the respective pins. Here, the tibial array is being fixed to the tibia. Now the tibial checkpoint, similar to the femur, the tibial checkpoint is placed on the hard cortical bone. The array should be coplanar to one another and parallel to the line of the site of the camera. The final tightening of all the three bolts on either side is done. Now we register the following. Number one is a hip center by moving the knee joint. Number two, medial malleolus. Number three, lateral malleolus. Number four, femoral checkpoint. Number five, tibial checkpoint. Now we will go to the next step, that is bone registration. This is a step where the 3D CT of the patient is matched to the native bony anatomy of the patient by way of bone registration. A total of 40 points 
are captured on the femur with the help of sharp probe. So be patient, we are going to show you all the 40 points. During the registration point, it is important to pierce the cartilage with the sharp probe such that the tip contacts the subcontinal bone. All the 40 points are taken care. The MACO product specialist will keep on rotating the 3D femur on the screen so that it is easier for you to register the, all the 40 spots. Once the registration process is completed, then we go to a process called re-verification. Here we are still doing the last uh, points. Now it is completely registered. Now you can see the distance to the bone is 0.2 millimeters. Now re-verification involves popping the large blue spears or we can call them bubbles or balloons to verify the original capture and distance to the bone. That means these bubbles will tell us how close we are to the bone. It is the same on the TBL side also. The re-verification is carried out and so that we know that our registration is 0.2 millimeters accurate. So re-verification is important aspect for the confidence to create in the surgeon's mind that the correction or the cuts will be absolutely spot on almost to the accuracy of uh, 2 millimeter and 0.2 or 0.1 millimeter. So here the registration and re-verification is being completed on the tibia. Once you get used to it, this all should not take more than five to seven minutes of time. That's what we call time neutrality. After four or five cases, your uh, tibia femoral bone registration and re-verification should not take more than five minutes. And like a conventional surgery, robotic surgery, after five to seven cases, it should not take uh, more time than the conventional surgery. That's what we call time neutrality. Because some of the critics keep saying that uh, we have to spend more time in the robot, no need at all. So now it is important to remove the femoral and tibial osteophytes. And there is a rat there below the, or behind the medial collateral ligament that has to be taken care. Uh, similarly, the tibial peripheral osteophytes also to be taken care. The osteophyte removal is very important aspect. And once the osteophyte removal is done, then we will go to uh, the registration process or the gap balancing process. This is the ligament balancing screen. After removal of osteophytes, the knee is flexed to 90 degrees and the flexion gap is captured using the osteotomes to tension the ligament. The final flexion and extension gaps are captured as indicated. Here, the extension gap is 21 mm and the flexion gap is 19 mm, 20 mm. Now, we distalize the femoral component by 2 mm to bring the extension gap down to 19 mm. Then, we move the tibia up by 1 millimeter. Now, the gap in flexion has become 19 and 18. Flex the knee and add one degree of external rotation to the femur to make the flexion gap 19-19. So you can see that external rotation of the femur will make the 19-19. The last step is to posteriorize the femur by one mm. By making these changes, now we got a perfect 18 and 18 mm gaps. So in the end, we can have a quick glance this marks the end of the gap balancing. Now we go to the step called Rio registration. That means the robo should position itself and then robo should know where the blade is there and where the femur is there in space. This is called Rio registration. So before that, we move the um, robot handle so that the robot can uh, see the pointer. And this is like in the, as you see in the small screen, it comes like a four quadrangular uh, dots. 
and then it moved around 120 degrees so that the robot knows the arc of the movement also. Then you take the arrows off and mount the saw blade and then you will register then final registration to see the pole as well as the saw blade. So now the robo knows exactly where the saw blade in relation to the bone is. Now this is haptic boundary, yellow lines. And once you go outside, it becomes red. It won't let you go there. It's one of the characteristic points of the um, robotic, uh, uh, macro robotic arm. It won't let you cut the soft tissue outside the haptic boundary. You don't need to see through the uh, wound also. Automatically, you can see the television screen. Once you go outside, it wants you and the blade will stop. It won't let you cut. That is the beauty of the haptic boundaries. Once you cut the anterior part of the femur, there are one or two methods by which you can do the bone cuts. Here you can see that by doing this, all the green area is uh, getting taken out. That means you have cut the anterior part of the and you are still in the haptic boundary. Then you go on to the anterior chamfer cut. So again, the blade automatically positions itself in the space to cut the anterior chamfer space. Again, you will be seeing on the television screen and see your objective is that you take off the green part on the screen. You don't need to see in the uh, wound at all. So it automatically cuts. The accuracy is almost 0.1 to 0.2 millimeter. And then once the anterior chamfer is cut, then we move on to the other part, what is the posterior cut, posterior part of the femoral cut. And again, the posterior cut is uh, taken care. So because again, the haptic boundaries are there, you can see the blade won't let you cut outside the haptic bone. One of the reasons why the pain is less in the robotic knees is probably we are not disturbing the posterior structures at all. And again, uh, this is a tibial checkpoint. And now we go on to the tibia. Uh, on the upper part of the tibia is again cut, again taking care of the green zone. And that will give accuracy in the cutting of the tibia. If you notice, we have not completed the femoral cut, but we have come and cutting the tibia. Now we change the blade. This is called 90 degrees blade. And with this blade, we go back again to the femur and take off the distal femur. And uh, in the first instance, with the straight blade, we have cut the anterior part of the femur and the anterior chamfer and posterior part of the femur. With this 90 degrees blade, we will cut the distal femur and the posterior chamfer so by changing the blade. And sometimes you, some people complete the femur and go to the tibia also. We can do either way. But convenience wise, this is the best way. Use the straight blade first and go to the uh, 90 degrees blade. Here you can see that I'm cutting the posterior chamfer. Again, you see on the screen, you don't need to bother to the wound. Now that is the right angle saw blade. And then you take off the meniscal remnants. And then this one is a posterior stabilizing triathlon. So for this, there is no robotic uh, guidance. This we have to do manually. If you are doing the cruciate retaining knee, which is also uh, available, we don't need to do this step. But uh, I tend to do PS mostly in the robotic knees, depending on the patient profile. If the patient is obese, I try to do PS knees than CR knees. So we have cut the femur box, and now we are ready for the trial implantation. The trial implantation is like any other uh, regular one. Now, once you put that, this is again an advantage of the robotics. Now we are reconfirming the balance. You can see the medial the lateral side 18 mm, 19 mm. Always medial side one millimeter tightness is acceptable and accepted. And even uh, by stressing either side, it looks quite good. Now in the flexion gap, 90 degrees is again, looks very good on both sides, 19 mm and 18 mm. 
and uh, limb on the right side if you see the limb is extended to almost 5 degrees 0 degrees now let us move to the tibial preparation the tibial preparation is again the same way like a conventional one here there is nothing like uh, to guide us with the rotation so we go to the our good old uh, rotation guidelines like a medial one third of the tibial tuberosity and the PCL footprint and uh, we will take off any uh, osteophytes beyond the tibial base plate. We will rod out with cocktail for the pain control and then uh, we are ready for the uh, cementing the tibia and uh, do the regular ones like a conventional uh, implants here. So here if you see we have not uh, done anything on the posterior side only here we are putting the retractor and uh, the releases are minimal if you see releases they have not done anything on the medial side except the medial osteophytic uh, there are uncemented triathlon also which is not available in india and if you got un uncemented triathlon implant the robot surgery takes less than one hour so I'm waiting for those implants to come to India. Uh, so with the accuracy of the bone cuts, the uncemented triathlon will do wonderfully well. And uh, the long-term results are also good with uncemented knees. Now the femur is cemented and uh, poly is uh, inserted and uh, we extend the knee. Now we can check it again. If you see, again, final balance extension 19 millimeters and 18 millimeters and uh, flexion 18 mm and 18 mm and that is a post-op x-ray every time you will get excellent results and the sizing the slope will be excellent thank you so much for listening to me